the first most important thing is you build something people need the hardest thing is actually to find what people need if you can build a product and scale it in india mm. you can go anywhere yeah. in the world it yeah. will work <laughs> nishal shady the founder of wazir x and the founder of shardium an auto scaling layer one blockchain with infinite scalability and solid security with wazir x having 15 million customers worldwide every web three founder i speak to they all have an india strategy or want to have an india strategy startups don't guarantee you anything job security they don't guarantee you success it's all an experiment you You said you use something called ETC strategy. What is ETC strategy, and how did you use it to build a mega startup? E stands for ego. T stands for temptation. C for curiosity. If you want to attract people to your product, you need to tap into at least one of these. I can give you some real world examples. When Gmail came, they did not open up the access to everyone. Only if you had an invite code could you access Gmail. Suddenly, your customers have become your marketeers. They are going and telling their friends, you know, there's this cool product, but only I can get you in. Shardium is a non for profit organization, whereas Wazir X is a for profit organization. What's the biggest difference between building a for profit company and a non for profit crypto network? When you fire a transaction on Shardium, no one can overtake. Yeah, it's time shot. In Shardium, you don't have a fee market. It's a auto scaling blockchain. It scales automatically. So, what happens to all the people who cannot pursue medicine or engineering? Yeah, I think a lot of them become. <laughs> 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 Over time, you start learning how to, like, you know, balance both. Um, like I, I remember. I used to be also like that. Um, you know, anyone messaging me, especially the company as a founder, you can ignore your. Uh, let's say on Twitter, you can still keep it by time. You could say only one hour a day or two hour a day. I'll be on it and I'll respond to everyone. But when it comes to operating your startup, uh, you need to be, always be there for your mm. people, right? They'll be stuck somewhere. They'll have some or the other work. And what I realized is. Um, That's actually not the best way because what you're doing is you're actually centering your entire company around you, because the more messages you're getting and the more decisions you're taking, that means less decisions the people in your company are taking, which means you're not creating leaders. You're actually creating yourself as the most important person. So um, you know, the best way to do that is to really give them more power, and um, you know, sort of focus your time with them on a schedule. Mm. Like you know, I'll meet you once a week, and you do everything else. And, and the uh, key things you're not sure about, you can yeah, ask me at like that a, time. Yeah, exactly. So unless there is something which is an absolute blocker that you can't decide, and uh, it only has to be me, then maybe you know you can come in between. But otherwise, this is our schedule. You know that you know there are some decisions to be made, but those are not like um, life, uh, you know, threatening or something. So you can do that in our call, and that helps a lot. Um, But yeah, it takes time and practice to reach that stage. Is it possible to change these habits within a company, or it's more when you build a new company that you integrate this new kind of culture? <laughs> Because people, right. you might tell them, "Hey, I trust you. Do your thing, please. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't piss me off. Like, do your thing, right?" Right. But a lot of them, they might not be kind of confident at this in the beginning, right? Right. Right. So, you know, there are two aspects to this. Your first question, which is, can you change um, an existing? Change is always hard. Um, can you? Yes. The the simple answer is yes. You can change. If, you know, doesn't matter how long the company has been in that uh, process of being centered around you as a founder for decisions. You can change it. But in a new one, it's the easiest because you start on day one. Um, the way to change that is a slower path because what will happen is you can't go from always responding to putting this overnight. Uh, You know, people will be like, uh, maybe he's not interested in the business anymore. Mm. So that has to be a gradual process, and sometimes maybe you know a few key changes, maybe bringing in a few new leaders who might already confirm to that way of working, one or two in between, so that the rest of the team can look at them. I think that's a better approach for an existing company, uh, but it is always doable. There's nothing that you cannot change in a company if you think about it. Nothing is impossible. Yeah, <laughs> if you believe in it. <laughs> yeah, 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 and you truly have to walk the path, though. Because I've seen a lot of founders who say yes, uh, I let my you know team um, take decisions, but that's not really true. Mm. Uh, because what happens is, you know, if they make a mistake, the the real definition of letting them take a decision is what is the outcome of a bad decision mm. for them. And you know, there's a saying, right? No one was ever fired for um, buying a, a PC in you know at IBM. So that used to be a saying. Uh, why uh, the 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 real meaning be behind that was. Um, You know, 
people could take decisions but they only took safe decisions mm-hmm. why is because they don't want to get fired otherwise so that's that's a that's a big thing when you think about really letting other people decide you know it's not just as you know hey you take your decision you know i'm fine and if it works well yes um, but if mm-hmm. it if it, if it goes in the uh, in the wrong direction then maybe you know you get, you get all the uh, the bad remarks or you might get fired if that is a fear that people have i don't think uh, this decision making will work you have to truly believe that probably for their function they are the founders you that's know? what i wanted to say uh, that's what i wanted to say actually hmm. how do you let people make their own decisions if they are not entrepreneurs themselves right, right. by definition entrepreneurs are like, yeah let, let me i know my thing let me d- do my own decision but a lot of people are not in that mindset because they probably have their f- own interest before the company's interest right because they think about themselves which is i want to keep my my job right job, yeah <laughs> i think the first thing is uh, find people who don't think like that <laughs> you know that's the most important thing, especially in a startup no I, i mean it because if you if you're thinking of a corporate which is a large company where you know and most times the objective of such large companies is not so much to innovate or to you know create something drastically different it's more about survival they are usually in survival and maybe 5% mm. growth rate year on year is okay for them and you know there's a certain set of audience which is the right employee for them but you need to find for your startup the kind of people who have that entrepreneurial mindset uh people who are ready to take risk because the fact that someone is going to join uh, so i don't believe that you know someone with such a mindset would ever join a startup yeah. because startups don't guarantee you anything they don't guarantee you uh job security they don't give you guarantee you success it's all an experiment so i think it's easier in a startup you know, uh, but yes what happens many times they're just used to having worked in a different startup they they understand that um, the challenges of a startup but they're not used to taking decisions so that's more like hand holding uh, for example you know some people might reach out to me and say hey you know this is the thing what to do mm. i could choose to just give them the answer versus asking them what do you think we should do and they say i think i should do this and i'm like okay let's do that um so i think that's the hand holding that you should probably do for initially you know for people who think that they need help with decision making what they really need is just you know your support it's not really your decision it's ultimately their decision but they j- at least feel okay i spoke to this guy you know so that's a better approach to helping them it's the same as being a consultant basically you're being yeah, paid yeah. for helping the client make their own right. decision right 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 right, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> but obviously you're not a consultant who are you <laughs> um who is nishal yeah yeah so uh you know I look at myself as someone who's um you know I've got a few key responsibilities I think um the first is to be an unblocker I look at myself as that um I'm not here to manage someone or to you know teach them or to impart my knowledge I'm only here as a team member to unblock you know if something is uh, beyond your control and uh, that involves a few things like even if you have an individual let's say Uh, responsibility and power as a leader of a function that will be cross functional stuff where you want to take a decision but the other function will not help you uh, or you know you might have a difference of opinion so that's where probably i'll come in i'll tr- try to you know get it off the road or maybe sometimes you need funds you know so you can't simply take your own decision with with money because um, there's a set budget for everyone and you might need more than that mm. so maybe then you come to me or sometimes like i said you just um, want um, you know I, i would say to tap into my experience because there's a lot of mistakes i made so i'm here to make sure you don't have to repeat those mistakes so these are the three key ways in which how i see when i run my startup and that's my responsibility and apart from that i think as an individual is my responsibility to take my product to the market and uh, make sure that everyone knows about it so i i usually focus on that being uh, you know a guy who's going to bring people to our product so i look at myself like that of course i can't do it alone with you know the entire team helps me but that's my primary function you were born in india yeah you I'm grew up in india, india and yes. you built two super successful companies in india right we had the founder of uh, antler vc mm-hmm. on the podcast magnus grimland mm-hmm. a few months ago and he said that india was a big priority for antler mm-hmm. to invest as a market why is india such an incredible 
opportunity for entrepreneurs who want to build great companies? I think um, if you if you think about India as a demographic, right? Um, you know, the first let's let's say the first um, most important thing is the number of people. We've got over a billion people. I think one point two, one point three billion people today. So you've got a massive uh, market. Um, the second is, you know, you could always say that even China has a, over a billion people. Mm. So you know, and that's also an important market. But if you look at the global, uh, you know, the global uh, construct of different com- uh, different countries, India is uh, you know a country which uh, is sort of you know most of the world feels is an open market where you know you can really come in and and you've seen that happen in india um and it also is due to the fact that english is you know um well used i would say mm-hmm. uh, most people know it or even if they can't speak they'll understand it so the language barrier in india for the for the you know rest of the world is minimized and that brings a lot of confidence versus you know a market like china where um, you need to really i would say have a local partner otherwise your chances of success are very very low but that's really not the case in india you anyone could come and compete so that is what i think opens up the market to everyone uh, the second is um, you know especially in uh, with let's say crypto for example um, india is a young country mm. um, a maximum uh, population is in the let's say 20 to 35 40 year age group so it's a young country with a young population and it's tech savvy so a lot of um, you know for the tech sector I, you whatever you want to do in india everyone's using tech for that mm. uh, so you know adoption is easy you don't have to convince people to you know use an app or um, it's also mobile first in a way mm. maybe using a website might be you know a difficult but uh, asking someone to download an app and use it it's fairly easy so i think uh, yeah. this usually attracts everyone if you look at uh, even the web2 companies like uh, let's say amazon uh, why did they enter india uh, when the ticket size per customer was very low um, because you know the per customer ticket size is probably 1/10th or maybe you know um, less than that for an indian customer versus let's say a us customer but the number of people who will use your product and your website is going to be humongous and that will teach you a lot of things in terms of scaling if you can build a product and scale it in india mm, then you go, they will go anywhere yeah. in the world it yeah. will work <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I, and and it involves everything not just the technology even your customer support scaling customer support in a country like india is a very hard thing to do one of the things that i have also realized you know when i was uh, building my second company which is wazirx a crypto exchange that uh, customer support itself is an art like how do you build a customer support to scale to so many people mm. um, and a lot of people need customer support um, you know because um, while there's a large number of people who um, you know understand tech but there's also a last, large number of people who are entering tech so it, it's not like they don't want to know they want to learn and you probably most times end up being the, like the first point of entry for them into their world of technology so so i think these are the things that you learn in india and these are also challenging Uh, but it's an open market so i think everyone's interested in india and i've seen so many vc funds having a, a lot of them having india focused funds mm. so in order first they start from globally they'll maybe you know have a us entity which is starting to look into india and eventually they'll have india specific uh, funds opening up the same is happening in web3 so if you see 3 4 years ago when i was launching the exchange india had about 5 million people in crypto and nobody was speaking about india as a like a crypto market uh but i knew that the market will grow which is why i launched the exchange in 2018 and then from from 5 million people we went to over 35 million people in india today who are into crypto so it was a massive growth uh, and most of this growth came from 2020 to 2022 like you know just 3 years mm. uh, and today uh, every web3 founder i speak to and every web3 let's say uh, marketing uh, you know uh, guy i speak to they they all have an india strategy or want to have an india strategy uh, they don't all have an india strategy i think that's not right they want to have an india strategy or they want to make sure that india is one of those countries that you know uh, their products are used at and um, that speaks volumes about the growth of the market it's also because while india has 35 million people today in crypto i think in the next 3 to 5 years it will have over 100 million people mm. um and so while our start was slow i think will will grow faster than the rest of the world 
and i i have a i i like like to say this that uh, you know usually indians come slow to a technology but when they come they come in huge numbers so that's what is happening to web3 uh, we started slow and you know for a long time it was not growing in india but now it's taken that rapid adaption uh, route and i think we'll cross over 100 million people in 3 to 5 years so yeah i think uh, india is going to be a key player for web3 in general you visit from india so we probably have a lot of great things to say about india but what do you dislike about india um i think uh i want to probably try to narrow this answer into maybe you know the the web3 ecosystem because that's where i am um and it's it's not so much of a dislike and dislike i think is a very strong thing uh what i see are maybe you know some of the shortcomings and some of the areas that need to improve and we'll get there but uh i think the 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 biggest has been um uh, i think the sort of this uh protective mindset um from maybe you know a lot of um, the key players in the industry um who are not part of web3 but they they need to be um i think that protective mindset is uh, what probably i would say reduces our growth um and when i say protective mindset you know and this is probably not just india honestly this is you know every yeah, i would say the us is, has the same yeah, problem right yeah, yeah, yeah. talking about legacy businesses yeah, yeah, yeah. banks or right. even the government who's not really pro right. i mean if i remember well two or three years ago there was something in the news and only if it was true that would say hey if you use crypto in india you could go to jail yeah right yeah which is not true which is probably not true right <laughs> yeah. but like it's right. like taking things to the next level right. to kind right. of prevent right. something that's inevitable exactly. at the end anyway exactly. exactly so that's the thing i think that's why when i was i mean uh, telling you this i realized it's probably a global phenomenon mm. um you know the legacy uh, systems and uh, operators of legacy systems are always afraid of something new um but i think we should probably open up our mindset and maybe the the more developed nations probably have that luxury of being more overly protective because they've sort of achieved success this we come back to the same you know the startup versus an established company Absolutely. mindset if you Absolutely. think about it it's the same you know yeah so the thing is question is should a startup copy a established company no you know um, google has an amazing office google gives free food to everyone So if I start my startup and give free food and have an amazing office my startup will be bankrupt you know that's not the way for me the way for me is in fact in today's world don't have an office be remote you know <laughs> <Absolutely>. be agile <laughs> and that's the way I look at uh, India India is a startup nation you know we are we are growing we are just uh, getting off the ground and we have an a- amazing set of talented folks so maybe some of the things we should not really ape from the more developed nations we should you know probably have our own outlook that uh, some risks are needed especially in the startup ecosystem if we were to compete globally with uh, the rest of the world in terms of you know how many unicorns if you if you see the um, the ratio is really tiny today uh, maybe it's less than 1 is to 10 maybe you know if we have 10 unicorns maybe the uh, you know the us might have 100 mm. I, i i think it's in that range so how do you narrow that gap not if you if you just uh, you know or try to replicate what they've been doing they do it today i don't think it'll happen we need to go back in history we need to see how the you know the us was in the early days of entrepreneurship you know what were the risks they took and maybe that's the kind of risk we have to take as a nation so i think that risk taking appetite should increase further it mm-hmm. already exists but you know i don't think it's enough we need to be even more uh, risk taking as a nation so yeah and that's very linked to if you think about I mean risk taking is very linked to the kind of optimal career path that parents see for their kids right which is kind of cultural Switzerland is the same in Switzerland you know it's a study law or study um finance and then become a consultant or a lawyer or an accountant right right and that's that's the definition of success because and it's not a bad thing obviously yeah. but because then you know you have enough money it's kind of a safe place you can buy your house get married but i obviously not going to contribute to a lot of entrepreneurship and i did the masters in madrid and i had quite a few people from india in this masters and they would all tell me they were all engineers 
it was an MBA, but they were all in engineers. Yeah. And, to, and they told me, in India, if you're not an engineer or a doctor, you're no one. Mm. Why do you think these two professions are so important in India culture? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm an engineer. And whenever I introduce myself, I tell people that, <laughs> you know, I'm an engineer just like everyone else in India. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, you know, it's nothing new or uh, nothing different. Um, I think it also comes, it's, uh, the answer is in your question about, you know, what parents want for the kids. Uh, they want sort of a stability and they want sort of, a, you know, a guarantee that, you know, you'll do well in life. Um, and if you think about uh, engineering and um, medicine, you know, these are two of the things that uh, the world will always need. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, India somehow, I think, just gravitated towards that. Um, and there are so many IT companies. Uh, there was an IT boom in the 80s and the 90s, which led to that. Then in, you know, the during the dot-com boom time also, there was a, um, a startup boom in India, which carried forward to the 2020 era now where we've got uh, India focused startups growing. So we started with being the back office of the world to then launching products, um, you know, for the sort of the global uh, population, but then quickly it pivoted to products for India. So I think uh, the the whole, you know, let's uh, have a secured future for our kids is what drives parents. And there's nothing wrong in that. Um, it's also to do with, you know, what stage uh, a country is in terms of, um, you know, uh, I would say fulfilling your basic needs. If you think about any of the um, more, uh, I would say, less uh, popular professions, um, or I'll give you an example. Let's think about climate change, right? If I do not have enough to feed my family, if I, you know, don't have a house of my own, um, why will I think about the environment? Yeah. So for me to th- get into, let's say, environmental related uh, profession, I need to first get out of my existential you know, threats. And I think uh, as a nation, a large part of a nation is still going through that uh, uh, you know, zone of going from uh, not having a house or enough you know, to feed to now getting into a comfort zone. So it's going to take a while before, you know, I think at least 30, 40 percent of the nation should be uh, in a comfortable position for you to then start having these alternative uh, professions in March, which I think, um, you know, the more developed nations, it's already there. They're developed for a reason. Right. And they have the luxury to choose these, uh, you know, um, professions that may or may not always give you a great financial outcome. Mm. Um, but not engineering and medicine always give you a financial outcome. It may not be the best financial outcome, uh, but it'll at least assure you that you'll get a job and you can, you know, eventually buy a house and have a normal life. So I think that's how India probably gravitated towards, uh, you know, I think these two professions. So what happens to all the people who cannot pursue medicine or engineering because they don't have the skills or maybe they don't have the means? Right. Yeah. I think a lot of them become entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more of them become entrepreneurs than those who've done because, you know, it's a double edged sword. You, you spent your money um, becoming an engineer or a doctor. Um, the risk that you have to take to quit a job and then get into, you know, your own building your own thing is far greater than, let's say, you didn't spend a lot of money. You just graduated a normal, you know, a BCom or something. Um, I, and I've seen a lot of my, you know, in my uh, friend circle, uh, uh, people who've just graduated, um, they've taken larger risks and they've gotten bigger rewards mm. uh, versus my engineering <laughs> mates. You know, <laughs> it's very few of them who have actually quit their jobs. That's very interesting. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, but it's very interesting yeah. because the, yeah, the, the, when you think about what the parents want is actually like the best thing for their kids, but it's kind of preventing them from kind of hyper growth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It does. But again, it does not, because if you truly have that in you, Mm. you know, that ambition, that drive, these things are just, uh, reasons to not do it. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, and, and you could always find a reason to not start up. I mean, at any given point in time for any of the ideas, 
You could always find a hundred reasons to not start up. Or you could find one great reason and say that I'm going to do this um, because it matters and you could find success. So, so it's more to do with, the, I think, your individual um, ambition. Mm. What do you want to do in life? At, as an entrepreneur, what's your take on, because uh, you've done the, you've done the engineering, you've done this, for me, it's the same. I've done bachelor, master, but I never, I never applied for a job afterwards. Mm -hmm. What's your take on university and diplomas when you hire people to build great companies? How important is it for you? Yeah, uh, I think it's a bit of, um, you know, both. It's not super important, but, um, you know, I would say it's an easier criteria to, and especially in the early days. Mm. So if I'll give you an example, um, if two 23 year olds come to me and one has a, you know, good college degree and has done everything and the other um, has not, but will say, no, I'm also going to work hard as an engineer. I'll also write code. And unless they have something else, let's say, They show me that I've worked uh, three years or four years on my own. I've created stuff. Mm. Um, then I might hire them. But if both of them don't have anything except a degree, how do I choose? Of a course. degree at least lets me know that this guy has studied something. Yeah. So it all depends on different stages. Um, but, but, but you would rather go for someone who, for example, let's take a concrete example. Do you have kids? Yeah. yeah. So for example, your kids, because you understand the all the, you know, entrepreneurship and the, the university. How are you going to approach school with your kids? Is it going to be something like, hey, I think you should still go to do, you know, university and all this stuff because, and then, because after that, your career is sort of de-risked, right? You can start to do, start a company, but if it doesn't work out, you still have a university degree or you're actually thinking, oh, there is doing this, three to five or six years of university, you're kind of like wasting your potential and therefore you should rather, you know, be a freelancer and start, you know, what's your passion? Try to discover your passion, learn online, get some clients where you don't even get paid, build a portfolio. And therefore, whether you build a company or whether you apply for a job, you're going to be much more employable. Like what's going to be your approach with your kids? <laughs> I think it's a very uh, deep question because well, I think first things first, uh, You know, I don't believe as parents, you should be really dictating how your kids should do. Um, and it all boils down to what your kid really wants. Um, sometimes I think uh, if I look at my my own, uh, you know, journey, um, I enjoyed, um, you know, my college uh, where I, I was doing engineering, um, more on the practical side. So my mark, I, I mean, I was not really like a university topper. Mm. Uh, but I was, I, I know for sure, one of those few guys who were creating uh, projects on my own versus my uh, friends who were downloading projects from the internet and just, you know, changing the code and just giving it because they were not very interested in that. Uh, so it all depends on, you know, what, and if I had the luxury back then of, let's say, not completing my graduation and just starting up, I would have done it. It's unfortunate I was uh, mm. in a time when, um, you know, It was happening in the US, you know, like you hear Mark Zuckerberg quitting or years ago, you know, everyone else uh, quitting their uh, uh, college and, you know, starting up. I don't think that's a phenomenon in India. Even now, it's probably just beginning. But back in my day, that was not, we didn't even know that is an option. Yeah. So maybe for my kid, I can tell that that's an option. Mm. Like, you know, maybe you're not sure today, go the college route. So the thing is, you know, it's like um, you got a map and there's also the objective to explore. You could either right away say, I don't want a map. I'll just start exploring. Versus say that I'll use a map. And at some point in my journey, I'll realize maybe I should take a left turn and it's not on the map, but I'm going to take that left. turn. So I think you should start normal, uh, which means, you know, if you're planning on, um, you know, studying, take the normal route. But at some point, you'll probably start realizing that this is not for me. Um, and then you should not get stuck. You know, that, so the question is not about deciding before. The question is when you are at different points in your life where you think that what you're doing is not right. You know, you're not going in the right direction or you're hitting against a wall over and over again. 
I think at that point you should take a decision, and it's very similar to running a startup also. Yeah, you know, right. yeah, yeah. Exactly <laughs> what I want to say. <laughs> so you, you you need to sometimes pivot. You know, uh, you can't be fixated on your idea. So you can't be fixated on like I've seen people uh, trying to you know they don't uh, clear their uh, semesters and then they want to repeat it and then they keep repeating. Mm. And then I realized that, you know, why are you doing this? If you're doing it only <laughs> for the sake of a degree, it's pointless. Mm. Um, so, and if you realize that if you're not able to clear them, you know, um, in a good way, why why even do that? You, you're you probably better at something else. Uh, so I think it's about being, at least if you're talking about kids, giving them that uh, ability to start thinking analytically at every point in their life uh, so that they can always change their decisions. Um, I think that's more important. Uh, now, coming back to, you know, hiring, honestly, uh, when I started, I told you about young, uh, you know, people who just out of college and you can choose. But usually what happens is we we emphasize a lot more on your experience rather than, you know, what you studied. Mm. So in our startups, when we are hiring, we really don't look at degree. I don't even remember the last time where I discussed degrees. Um, it's usually, you know, what's your achievement? Mm, and uh, we are in a world where today even 20, 22 year olds can show a lot of achievements. You know, they. it used to be maybe in my time, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the only thing used to be a degree. But I think uh, today uh, I've seen kids, uh, you know, without degrees or they're not even engineers. They've probably done something, some other, you know, um, uh, higher education uh, but they've created so many things they've either they have their own blogs and they've become podcasters or uh, they they run their own youtube channels or uh, they've created a small apps uh, during their time you know on in the free time even though they don't have an engineering background so we've seen quite a variety of uh, you know i would say skill sets today in youngsters so it's today i think it's easier to just look at the person and hire like in terms of what have they done Versus what have they studied? Absolutely. There is a lot of opportunities everywhere. And there's a lot of people who want to start businesses, right? But they're scared. Or maybe they just want to find an excuse to not start, right? And so something that's really compelling in your story is how you started your first company, which is not the, I'd say, most, not the most classic way of starting a company. You did it beside working a full-time job to manage your risk. You told me I waited to make tons of money before going full-time into my first company. But obviously, doing two things at the same time is not a walk in the park. So what are the sacrifices that are required to build a successful company while working a full-time job? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, I remember a time when uh, I think I hardly slept, uh, you know, because I had a nine to five job, but it was not just a job. Uh, it took me about, I think, an hour and a half to reach my job. Mm. So, so you know, I had to leave early morning and uh, travel an hour and a half uh, to reach my job. And then, you know, nine to five becomes nine to seven really quickly in any of your jobs. So when you say nine to five, you can't really, you know, just stop working at five. It's usually five, six or seven p.m. And then by 8.30, you know, 9-ish, I used to come back home, quickly have my dinner and then start working on my uh, product. Uh, so it used to be like after 9, 9.30 p.m., I used to start working. You know, maybe I used to get three, four hours or, you know, uh, five hours of sleep. And then the next day, the same routine. I still love my weekends um, because in the weekend, I used to get a lot of time uh, to continue building my startup. So, yeah, I think um, I did that for about... I, uh, about a year after I launched my startup. But uh, to be honest, I also did that uh, three years before that. So I think I've done a routine like this for four years because if my uh, while I launched my uh, product as a side project in 2010, I'd been trying a variety of things before that. You know, a lot of small little things. In fact, the first thing I started was as a blogger. I started writing a blog, a technology blog, to uh, solve people's tech problems and that got some traction and you know that also used to be the same routine come back from work you know sit and write blog posts and this was uh 2007 2008 um blogs were like it's the blog it was the thing right the, yeah the blogging era 
yeah. everyone and uh, i remember reading articles of, from bloggers saying hey this is my monthly income you know i made so much money from adsense i you know and i made so much money from referral so i used to see that and be very uh, you know motivated that i should have my blog so about i think 2 years i uh, did my own blog i think the highest i earned fr- uh, from that business was about 1000 or 1500 dollars a month which is not bad uh, for you know um, considering i was in india and um, i was 23 or 24 or uh, 22 23 it was good uh, but i always knew that this is not um, you know the path for me because I, i while i was doing it i did not see that as like a you know a business i want to grow uh, because i was more interested in uh, in actually coding and building stuff uh, rather than writing content you know i like reading content i think it's very hard to create content uh, personally uh, i would rather code you know that's my way of writing content you know create uh, more uh, products so i uh, in 2010 i launched my first uh, you know side project that uh, went viral it was a social media management app mm. uh, and it was also just pure i think luck i would say that uh, it went viral why is because i i made that app and uh, this was for twitter and it was a very simple feature uh, you could unfollow people that you were following if they did not follow you back mm. so it was just a very simple feature <laughs> and i made it for myself because i was following i remember about 5000 people mm. and twitter had an upper limit you could not follow more than 5000 people unless they were following you so i hit my limit and i had about 1000 people following me so there were about 4000 people i needed to unfollow and uh, i tried doing manually and i realized this was not going to you know get done so i built a program and it worked well and i thought let's also launch this as a product and i sent a email to techcrunch and uh, i still remember this was i think 2 am in the night uh, i immediately got a response from uh, one of the writers at techcrunch saying um hey uh, no i got a response from michael arrington mm. the founder of techcrunch yep. saying i tried this but there's a bug in the program and uh, i was excited uh, the fact that he even tried and you know he pointed i said i'll fix it and the next thing i know he posted about that on techcrunch and uh, immediately i think the first day i got 5000 or 7000 people who came on the website so that's when i realized that uh, what i had built was uh, you know needed by others as well and uh, i quickly started then you know building more into that it eventually became a social media management product uh, but the initial days were like because it was such a simple feature i did not know whether this would be a eventually a good product mm-hmm. or whether this was just a fad so i decided not to quit my job you know in the excitement that something took off uh, i was cautious i said i'll i'll continue to work and continue to build this now uh 3 months into building this it had reached about i think uh, 80 or 100000 users uh, and i had a new problem which was uh, i was paying more for server charges than i was making money i think uh, so you know while uh, that seemed successful for 2 to 3 months i realized that success is making me poorer right mm. now so i needed a way to you know pay my server charges mm. uh, and that's how i introduced the pay- payment uh, uh, you know uh, method and i said if you want to use more of this please pay me and within the next 3 months it started paying me more than my day job and and more as in uh, i was making more in a month through this side projects than i was making in a year on my day job so mm. that's where i i had reached and that sort of gave me the confidence that you know okay there's something great in this i can quit you said i got lucky yeah, yeah. do you believe in luck absolutely but uh, you know i wouldn't be lucky if i wasn't really working hard so of course but but it is because um, what if i had sent that email a little early or a little late and and i don't know um, but back in the day getting a response getting tech crunch to even look at your email was almost impossible uh, considering the amount of rest in, in you know uh, inbounds they used to get so i think it was just pure luck or maybe you know something di- but not hard work it's not like i sent a uh, 500 emails and then they responded just send one email and you know i got a response and they also and they found a bug and they still decided to write about it <laughs> i mean it has to be luck right <laughs> What's your message to a 24 years old engineering graduate who's been working for 2 years in a corporate is bored as fuck and wants to start a company? 
<laughs> I don't think uh, boredom is uh, the reason you should start a company. Mm. I was never bored in my job, by the way, and I was uh, really good at it. And in fact, I was, uh, I think I was one of the best um, whenever I, wherever I worked and I always give my best. Um, you should start a company because I think, uh, you know, if you see a problem and you think there is no solution, no one's building it or why is someone not solving it? I think that's the best reason to start a company. Absolutely. Um, you know, if you start for boredom, uh, I'll, I'll tell you there are enough boring uh, times in a startup founder's life. In fact, there are more boring times and I'll tell you what, the definition of boring. Let's say for me, I loved coding, mm. but finance was boring for me. And, uh, you know, in my job, I've never had to do finance. But when once I started up, I had to do finance. I had to do, you know, I, uh, I had to write content. Like I said, I escaped. I wanted to write code, but I had to write content to bring people to it. I had to pitch to investors. That's the most boring job, by <laughs> the way. Pitching to investors and trying to raise money is the most boring job, according to me. Uh, so yeah, I, and and slowly and today I don't code. So in a way, I, you know, my my first love is coding, but I hardly do that. Uh, so if you think about boredom and if you start, I don't think it'll uh, take you too far. You need to think about problems, and you need to truly believe that this problem has to be solved, and then work towards it. I think that's the way to really succeed as a startup founder. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, it's kind of, it sounds so simple, yeah. but it's the way to go. Hey, there is a problem and I'm trying to find a solution to that. I'm not trying to be cool. Yeah. Actually, because entrepreneurship is not that cool. Yeah, it is. I'm not like, it's just, hey, like there's an issue and if no one else does it, I kind of yeah. have to take that responsibility because right. no one else is doing it, right? So you spent six years building your first startup, Crowdfire. Actually, even... I could say almost nine, 10 years, right? Because you said you started three years before trying different things. Yeah, I started in 2010. Um, but no. But uh, before uh, that, you said like three years yeah, doing yeah, blog. I, I mean, the. So, so essentially, to get to getting lucky, right? And then actually scaling the company, it's almost, let's say, eight, nine years. Yes. Which is close to the, the classic uh, 10 years maybe. overnight success, right? Right, right, right? That everybody talks about. Oh, right. man, overnight success, overnight success. <laughs> You scale the company to 20 million users. What does it take to scale a company to tens of millions of users? Um, it takes a lot of time. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of things. Um, but it, it starts with a few things. I think the first most important thing is you build something people need. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds very simple, but it's very, very hard. It's the hardest thing. The hardest thing is actually to find what people need. You know, nothing is harder than that. Once you found what people need, um, and like I said, in that, I, I think I got lucky in that also. I just found what I needed. That was my first startup. Uh, I needed it. A genuine problem. Uh, I could not follow, uh, you know, more people. Uh, thanks to Twitter's, uh, you know, arbitrary rules back then. So I found a problem, but just happened that many people had that problem. Uh, in fact, 20 million people over time. Uh, so that was good. So f do that. But once you found a problem, uh, you know, that uh, you know you should solve. I think you should be ready for a a lot of uh, hardships along the way. It's never going to be smooth, and um, be able to overcome those hardships. It starts with the uh, first is finding that initial team, the hardest. Uh, you know, unless you raise ten, twenty million dollar on day one, maybe uh, it's easier. But usually that's not the case. So it'll be very hard to find that initial team members. Um, then from there, you know, learning the the tricks of the trade in terms of most founders come with just one uh, skill set. Like I entered with just an engineering skill set. But if you think about a company, and I think it takes time to understand uh, that a company is a lot like, uh, you know, working out. Um, if you're going to focus only on one, it's like, you know, would you only do exercise for your arms and forget the rest of your body? And unfortunately, a lot of uh, times I've seen entrepreneurs fail is because they focus only on one thing. They're like, I'm a coder. I'm only going to code. I'm going to not do anything. And, uh, and you mm -hmm. know, for, unfortunately, on the Internet, there have been all these, um, you know, fancy things like if you build, they will come. One of the biggest lies that mm -hmm. the Internet has ever taught people is if you build, they will come. They'll never come. You need to <laughs> learn how to distribute. You know, you need to learn how to attract people to your product. 
and and those are other parts of your body that you have to work on you need to learn finances also that's why sometimes you hear about you know one bad thing and the startups go bankrupt why because they've not thought of about their finances you need to learn how to raise money as well because without money all your strategies are useless you know you'll have the best of ideas but you don't have money you need to hire great leaders along with you because a single leader company you're not well for a week or you want to go out on vacation then your company is not going to succeed so i think that's a lot of these things that along the way as a founder you should you know inculcate in you and uh, all of those things i think eventually lead to success persistence is the most important though but in the right direction because i've seen people persist you know at most like a it's a dead end and they still want to persist you know so having a a, a better understanding of you know your path so you can persist if your car is moving forward but if you're hitting against a wall there's no point of persisting so even understanding that is important so where is the trade off because on one side you have steve job who says that he's convinced that you know what separates 90% of the people who are successful from those who are failing is purely persistence and perseverance and then you have some other views who say actually being persistent is not good because you you could be very easily kind of be lying to yourself and be in denial and end up failing right so what's the answer self awareness yeah see awareness is the most important thing uh, and it's not just about uh, startup success but just you know personal success um, you know in general if you're not self aware you cannot really go too far um, because you're then um you know going in the direction that you're being sent by anyone and any, everyone in the world you read an article and suddenly like yes let's do this you know <laughs> uh, you you see a tweet and you're like yes let's do this so being self aware is very important but also i think being more um uh, at least how what's worked for me is being more mission driven rather than being driven by a product or you know your start have a mission um uh, you know that this is what you want to achieve uh in terms of and it could be your personal vision mission or your company's mission whatever mm. uh but if you're aware of that what happens is uh you know everything else becomes secondary and then you are able to pivot if you need you're able to change things you're able to you know take a beating in one area of your product but you know change something and succeed somewhere else so i think uh that mission vision mm. you know those are very important things for a founder makes a lot of sense actually so it's i find the problem that other people have i define a mission around it yes to solve this problem and then everything i do is sort of tools to get to solving this problem Absolutely. but i'm going to try to find what works best right and Absolutely. it could mean doing something completely different than what i'm doing as long as the mission and the goal is clear exactly. then the rest is secondary it makes a lot of sense you you said you use something called etc strategy which help you scale to millions of users what is etc strategy and how did you use it to build a mega startup yeah i i i came up with this uh, for my first startup um and you know e stands for ego t stands for temptation and c for curiosity the idea is that uh, you know if you want to attract people to your uh, product you need to tap into at least one of these in your attempts all of these is the best like if you can have ego temptation and curiosity all baked into your go to market strategy that's like the best mm-hmm. um, but even one of them is uh, you know enough and i can give you some real world examples um, not just my product but everywhere else um, i don't know if you remember but uh, uh, when gmail came mm-hmm. for example uh, they did not open up the access to everyone they said only if you had an in- invite code could you access gmail and that was i think one of the smarter marketing because whoever had a gmail invite code uh, you know it was sort of pride for them to invite their friends and it it worked in many other start, uh, startups i think even recent which is hey i have an invite code if you want and you know that's more like you, suddenly your customers have become your marketers they're going and telling their friends you know there's a school product but only i can get you in so that's sort of an ego that they you know get because of something like that So that's worked really well in you know history. It's been it's been used by uh, fintechs, Monzo, yes. Revolut. It's used a lot in crypto with this cause. It's always yeah, it, and it's not going yeah. to change. It's always going to be yeah. there. It's going to come in different forms. 
but you need to understand what the base is it's mm. all ego so now when once you understand that then you'll start thinking about marketing and you know how do i bring an ego for our customers mm. and then that's a smart approach to do uh the second temptation is the easiest and most people use it and so much in web3 you know airdrop the biggest temptation ever you know <laughs> given airdrop and everyone wants to come in. free money uh, yeah free money uh so temptation is uh, the other aspect of um, you know um go to market strategy for any product that you can come curiosity curiosity um is uh, tricky but you know it works really well if done right for example uh, social networks had who viewed your profile kind of thing um linkedin had um, you know the same thing and they used it for converting you to paid customers absolutely um so that's yeah. what you mean curiosity is not necessarily showing who but saying hey if you pay yes, more yes. you could see who right 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 um, okay so there's a third aspect and if you can combine all three beautiful if not use one or two of them uh, but yeah you start with this as a framework rather than saying oh i want a million users what do i do you know instead of that say that how do i use ego in my product then a million forget million you'll get 10 million users if you can really do it right mm. or how do i bring in temptation in my whole product journey mm. or curiosity i think these are the three i've added a few over time i think but uh, these have been the three that have been really you know uh, helped me uh, right from my first startup um yeah so that's the etc framework uh that i employ you you said hey at some point about too many users and the cost of the servers was too much right so you had to start charging people and you said that you started uh, charging people monthly right doing these monthly payments which it was 2010 right uh yeah in 2010 i think i first started with the yearly yearly okay and uh, then i moved to monthly which today seems normal yeah but it wasn't back then tell me about the kind of creative moment that made you invent this kind of new way of charging users and ultimately growing your company because i mean the entire you know software as a service business model is and and the, the crazy valuations of businesses is, is all based on are you able to build this monthly recurring revenue Revenues. from customers who pay right, every month right right yeah and i didn't even know the term it's very common to mrr and arr mm. monthly recurring revenue and uh, annual recurring revenue but back in the day it was just need so <laughs> i don't think uh, it was so much of a design for me uh, i i first put a payment uh, you know I, I, actually i started with the one time i made a, a payment page and said one time you can pay $5 um and in a month i think i got maybe 1000 pe- uh, i think maybe 100 200 300 people so it would be one off forever yeah one off forever okay. that's how i started but quickly i realized in this you know i would have to keep finding new customers yeah. forever <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah so so i said no this may not work let's let me do yearly but there was also the fear because see when you start with something like that and then suddenly i thought i should do it yearly and i was afraid that would people go for it or not but that's a good test actually yeah oh, it's a good test right so and i tried it and you know surprisingly the number of people who were signing up for the paid plan did not reduce you know so i i mean one fine day i just switched it and the number of people who signed up yesterday for a uh, uh, forever uh, plan the same number of people or in fact a little more signed up for the yearly plan because the product was growing as well so that uh, you know told me that okay i can experiment more and within a few weeks i introduced a monthly plan and again it didn't change mm. uh, of course i at that point i was like i'm not going to go below a month month was good enough mm. uh, so that's how i did but yeah today it comes naturally uh sas is known uh, when you're launching a product you know you do it on a monthly basis you know and yearly you will give a discount or something but it's always a monthly but back in those days there were no playbooks around uh, you know all of these things i just were experimenting everyone was experimenting so you're growing this company scaling to over 20 million users and then in 2017 you try to buy bitcoin during the crazy bull run right right and you said you tried to buy bitcoin but it took you a week yeah, yeah so you realize there is a huge opportunity to build a crypto exchange in india to help people buy again you're solving your own problem hey i needed one week to buy bitcoin probably other people we want to buy bitcoin or other cryptos and because it takes that much time this is an opportunity 
And then within four years, you built, you spent four years building the largest crypto exchange in India, was your ex. The first question is, how do you leave a successful business with 20 million users that you could scale maybe to 100 million to start a new one from scratch? Yeah, I think uh, you don't have to make that choice, honestly. You you know, if you want to build a new business and you have an existing business, I think it just uh, depends on your ability to scale. If you've learned to scale yourself, you can do it. Uh, or if you want to, because the one thing it requires is a lot of energy. It's not so much of the time. Time is uh, something that you can manage. The energy is the thing that, uh, you know, it's not always easy to manage. Do you want to explain what, it, what you mean by energy? Do you mean like when you build something new, there is a lot of brainstorming that goes, I mean, on one side you have a well-oiled company, the other side everything needs to be rebuilt. That's what you mean, right? You need no, to I just mean maybe I should use a better term, ambition. Mm, okay. Uh, it's just the want. The you know, is it in you? Do you want to, um, you know, run multiple companies? I think if you truly want to, you can do it. But sometimes you feel better as an individual if you're just focused on just one entity uh, and you know, do everything around. And there are enough examples of successes in all of both of these varieties. Maybe more common with one company only and a little more uncommon in, in the multiple enterprise space, but it's doable. Uh, so for me, I think I've always known that I wanted to do more, you know, uh, in terms of varieties of products that may not always make sense for the same company to do. Um, and I don't want to be, you know, brought down or, or held back because of that. So, so I was very clear that if I ever get an opportunity, which is uh, interesting and exciting, I'll do it. Having said that, um, for my first company, while it was growing rapidly, um, in 2017, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, they started changing the terms of their uh, platform, by the way. So I had to sort of pivot the company from being consumer driven to more business driven. Uh, and after that, it was not so much about the, uh, the number of people I was signing up. It was more about how many businesses. Okay. And that's something that, you know, I did not truly enjoy. I'm a consumer guy. I love building products where millions of people will use it. I think that uh, gives me even more ambition. You know, I can grow my ambition. And I try to focus on things where I'm able to grow my ambition. So I didn't, it's not like I always grew up with, you know, um, a, a great ambition or something. But I think my ambition has been increasing and growing. And I love that. Um, so, yeah. So I, that was one of the other reasons why I thought that I should build another product which can be consumer driven and it just happened that I was in crypto and and also this whole fact that uh, companies like Instagram and Twitter can you know ask you to change things overnight and you have to you have no choice like even I think five days ago I, because I, I, that company is still operating Crowdfire is still mm -hmm. working and we still have customers but B2B five days ago I think uh, we got an email where again uh, Facebook was cutting off the APIs for Facebook groups so now third party products that are using, you know, Facebook's APIs, they can't use Facebook uh, groups products in their, uh, in their apps. So this is what every, um, I would say social media, uh, large social media product has been doing. Absolutely. And this is what every uh, centralized entity will ever do. Because when you start building something on top of them and you start making a good amount of revenue, for the internal revenue team of the centralized entity, it's like, hey, there's $50 million or $100 million being made by these set of products that are using our API. Why don't we uh, capture that money? So what do you do? You cut off that access and you build it on your own. Mm. So, so this has always been the problem that I realized in 2017 when this happened to me, that um, you, know, you can't rely on a centralized ecosystem to build products. And it's not just uh, APIs. You build on the App Store and the Play Store, they can change their games anytime. Every time, you know, there's a new uh, launch by Apple or Google, hundreds of products die, by the way. We don't realize that. You know, we have to go and find those. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, when Apple launched their news, uh, uh, this thing, there used to be Flipboard or one of the product, which was very popular as a news site. And suddenly Apple News really sort of, you know, killed the product because they have an unfair advantage now. They can distribute it to all their customers. And no one's going to download you. Uh, you know, even music affected Spotify to a large extent. Same with Google also. So I think uh, 
that is what pushed me towards decentralization absolutely because in decentralization even the founder of the blockchain can't really tell you what you can and cannot do that's the beauty of decentralization so this is something you understood in 2017 yeah. when you discovered bitcoin it's not only hey there's a bull run i want to buy bitcoin because it's going up no. but it's also the ethos side yeah. of saying hey i want to contribute to this ecosystem and have more people having access to this decentralized mechanism. And I'm going to do that first by doing what I do best, which is consumer application, essentially to help people buy, because that's a problem that I have when I try to buy Bitcoin, right? Right. But I discovered Bitcoin uh, way early though. So uh, in fact, I think in in 2010, uh, you know, is when I, I think I even tried running a Bitcoin node. Mm. But it was just that because I used to love anything new. I, I've always tried anything, any new product, any new technology. I've always tried, uh, especially because I used to write a lot of blog posts and all. Uh, but yeah, I never thought of it much. I tried it. And then in 2012, I also remember there were so many um, wallets that were coming up, new wallets in 2012 for Bitcoin. I tried them. Um, but it's always been on and off. But in 2017, when... Because I always wondered, ultimately, what was the use of this? You know, I, I, honestly, I did not find the need for it. But in 2017, I realized from, at least from a core philosophical point of view, why decentralization was needed. And and just happened to be that there was a bull run at the same time. Um, so I went deeper. Um, it was not an overnight thing. I think it took me seven, eight months to decide that, you know, I really want to do something here. Mm. Because there was a lot of push and pull internally also, you know, um, you're already building, you know, you're right. And that was my first time when I was really transitioning from one company to now, can I have two companies? So that took a long time. I, in fact, uh, I went to uh, San Francisco and I spent six months there um, in 2017, figuring out, you know, whether I, sh I should really, because I was at that point in my time when I had to really clear my mind and think. And in India, I was working with my entire team and it was going to be very hard for me to disconnect myself and think whether I should do it. So that's where I, I actually went to San Francisco, spent six months. And that's where I took the call that, you know, maybe I should try this, a new paradigm, a new ecosystem, uh, but cannot be controlled. So let's do this. And that's how I came back. And then I was trying to find what's the reason, what to build. And then I was like, let's go to the basics, solve your own problem. <laughs> That's how the exchange came about. Take me down the journey of starting the largest India uh, crypto exchange from scratch and turning it into a business that generates hundreds of millions per year. Yeah, um, it's been a it's been a crazy ride for us. Um, it's been five years now. I launched it in 2018. Um, I actually announced it in I think uh, Jan 2018. Mm. And uh, if you remember, the top of the bull run. Yes, it was the top of the bull run, <laughs> and uh, you know, obviously, and and everyone was like, you know, nothing's going to stop us. Uh, crypto, I think everyone thought we've made it, and uh, this is how crypto will continue to grow. And uh, and it was my first time also, uh, where I was objectively trying to build something. So when we announced it, I think within a week we had about uh, forty thousand or fifty thousand people sign up. And this was not a product. This was just a, a sign-up page. So a pre-sign-up. Mm -hmm. And we, we got 50, 60,000 people. The reason why I did a pre-sign-up page, by the way, uh, there's a backstory to that, is um, there were already seven, eight exchanges in India. Sure, you know, it was difficult to buy. They were slow and, you know, all those problems existed. But I wanted to be 100% sure that if I'm going to build a solution, there has to be a need for it. Comes back to that, right? Mm -hmm. Find a problem. So I thought the best way to do that is just announce that you'll build an exchange. It'll have all, it'll solve all of your problems. It'll have these features and stuff and see if people sign up. Because if, if that pre sign up did not work, I don't think I may not have, I may have pivoted thought of something else, but to my surprise within a week of 40,000 plus people signed up. And that gave me the indication that yes, you know, this is again, not an isolated problem, which only you're facing, but the rest of the country also wants this solution. Then we started building this and uh, in March we launched it, um, 8th of March 2018 and uh, the bear market had started. Uh, you know, Bitcoin was going down, the moods were going down, 
and by the time we launched we had over 100000 people who had pre signed up but i think less than 1000 people came on the exchange on the day one of those pre signers 1000 or 2000 people because you know <laughs> crypto was now seen as uh, will it survive or not yeah. uh, so but for us i think uh, while we were building the exchange and there was the, this bull run and then there was a bear market i was very clear on why i was doing it yeah my and it i'm still on that mission by the way which is um, it is my personal mission is if you if you look at the internet for example uh if i could go back in time and i could choose a mission uh that would personally satisfy me it would be that i would get everyone on the internet because i've seen magic happen because of people getting access to internet i'm also a, a prime example of that if i had no internet i don't think i would be an entrepreneur you know that email would have never happened uh, you know nothing would have ever taken off so i personally believe that if i was to go back into 1995 maybe you know and i was in an entrepreneur my only mission would have been get people on the internet and do everything you can and that's the kind of mission i have now is get everyone into the decentralized ecosystem that's my personal mission and um, you know i want to make sure i'm responsible for a large number of people to get into this ecosystem so what they do after that is actually you know it's not my concern i want to bring them in that's why i started the exchange because that was the entry point you know it's it's an on ramp for a reason mm. you come in you experience what crypto is uh, sure it's centralized you know that's not you have to go forward in your journey but at least i am the guy who's helping you on board so when the markets went down i still believed in this you know decentralized ecosystem and the spirit of decentralization so we continued which is the only way to survive yeah, yeah you have the mission yeah. if your goal is to make money you're not going to stay yeah, for yeah. two years right, right, in right. the bear market right so so yeah so we started that and uh, within a month there was a banking ban in india so while the bear market if it was not enough to demotivate you know someone to build within a week uh, we could not have bank accounts and we were on a uh, exchange which uh, you know allowed you to on ramp <laughs> so 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 we were now left without a bank account we were about 6 weeks old i think um and slowly we started seeing uh, some of the other established uh, start uh, like uh, exchanges shutting down or you know moving out of the country and stuff because you virtually can't operate if you don't have a bank account uh, but you know for us i think uh, our mission kept us going and uh, there were also you know in in chest i usually say that we were already at ground zero when you launch a startup you know there's nothing you have to lose so we were anyways at gr- ground zero so you know we we decided we want to keep doing this so what was uh, the solution there just wait and hope no, that no. you have access to a bank probably no, not no i think that's why uh, the self awareness part comes in that you know uh, you could believe in that but maybe then the exchange is not the way if you, you know i would not suggest um, waiting would be a solution for a startup because that's default death if you're not growing you're dying as a startup so we decided that uh, okay we can't have a bank account but individual people can have a bank account and they can transact between them so we introduced peer to peer p2p we only custody the crypto and we lock it and you could do the transaction you could send it from your personal bank account to the other person's bank account and then we'll release the crypto to you once the other person has acknowledged that they've received the money from you then we'll release the crypto to you so we and that's how we started attracting a lot of people now we innovated that uh, we didn't have a traditional regular p2p where you know uh, you had to choose whom to buy from this was more like an order book that we created so you just had to put an order but when it matches then we'll show you the bank account and you have to make the transfer and that really worked well because uh, and this was the perfect thing about you know finding solutions to the problems that your users are facing um and people loved it and we s- quickly saw p- uh, people signing up so so i i would say we made a bad situation into an opportunity for ourselves and this continued for about um uh, i think 2 years where we were operating with the peer to peer model um and we almost reached i think we were close to uh, or maybe we crossed a million users in those 2 years uh just in this model a million users um and uh, that that shows how much people really wanted crypto yeah 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 million or 2 million i'm i i i'm not un- exactly sure and we were profitable 
so you know we didn't uh, we anyways did not raise money i i invested initially you know because this was my second startup we never raised money uh, but yeah we became profitable as well in that time period so we became profitable in the harshest of condition uh, where you know you don't did not have a bank account your competitors were uh, dropping off um, and then the in 2020 magic happened which is uh, the the supreme court of india overturned this ban um and that opened the flood gates because now we could have a bank account and uh, and in march 2020 this happened it was in march yes and that's when bitcoin started so obviously up. covid crash and then when things yeah. went crazy from yeah. there right yeah so so it was just perfect timing mm. uh and because we been in, we were in the ecosystem we were you know helping people um on board to crypto i think we became the beneficiaries of that m- massive number of people coming in by the way in this uh something in, uh, something very uh, important that happened in those two years when there was a banking ban was uh, i launched a campaign called india wants crypto um and my objective was every day i'm going to tweet uh to our finance minister and uh, you know to the uh, to everyone in the ecosystem about why we need to uh, be you know involved in crypto as a nation and this this campaign i ran it for over a thousand days um where every day i used to tweet um and i was just uh you know lucky that everyone from the community used to retweet it and share it and it sort of became like a thing for the community you know everyone rallied around it india wants crypto um and i think that was ne- needed because uh you know a at least in our growing years we've all been accustomed to uh, markets that are were made by someone else you know ecosystems that were made by someone else here crypto is a new ecosystem we're just lucky that we happen to be the first movers and then you need to learn from the early movers of the other ecosystem that exist you know what were the early days like and in the early days you have to take initiative um, and i decided that i needed to do this so that you know someone starts talking about the need for crypto in india why india should participate in this ecosystem so that campaign really worked well for us uh, in terms of uh, building the ecosystem and as a result i think we our exchange benefited and uh, from 2020 to 2022 we grew to over 15 million people uh, on our exchange we did over 40 45 billion dollars in trading volume in 2021 uh, made over you know uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue uh, so it was crazy but it was a result of so many years of you know really working hard on the on the product innovation on um, bringing people together um ensuring that even the media for example i think most of them were not really interested in crypto so much or did not understand we made it our uh, you know goal to uh, help answer even the most basic of questions so that they also understand today i think uh, if you talk to people in the indian media they're well versed with uh, crypto and you know the ecosystem they understand it really well but initially back in those days um, it was really hard for them and it was you know it i believe it was our role and a responsibility to make it easy for them to understand crypto this many times you know i see today where people like uh, you know when someone asks a very basic question about crypto they sort of start making fun of them mm-hmm. but if you do that you are having a exclusive culture but if you think about uh, you know uh decentralization it should be an inclusive culture where everyone in the world should be part of it which means you'll always get the most basic question like you know and the questions may not always be what you like hearing like instead of someone asking you what is crypto sometimes they might say crypto is a scam but that does not mean that you know it uh you, you just start uh, shutting off you need to start talking to them about the benefits so that's the approach we took we were like you know it doesn't matter you hate crypto it's okay but we can still have a conversation and that really worked well for us educating everyone yeah essentially so you start an exchange you don't raise any extra money you grow it to 15 million users hundreds of millions of revenue but that's not enough for you because it's centralized right probably in your greater kind of scheme of what's my mission hey i can't stop at a centralized exchange no matter how successful it is because it doesn't it's just the first step towards decentralization right yeah no it's not so much about the centralization aspect it's more about uh 
my ambition has now grown to having more impact in more areas with the exchange i brought 15 million people and we'll continue to grow that and we might bring maybe 20 30 million people the question is how do i bring 100 million people online you know that's my uh that's the question i ask myself and uh, at this rate it'll take maybe i don't know 10 years but how can i do that faster how can i get to be saying that i was responsible for 100 million people to be part of web3 mm -hmm. so when i think about that that's where uh, you know i want to be involved in a lot more and um, so that's one the second is it's also the journey even for our exchange users the next journey is uh, decentralization they go on chain on chain yeah and that is where i found a new problem you know um uh, <laughs> we had 15 million people we uh, you know who are on the exchange i think less than 5% of the people have ever uh, moved on chain by the way which makes uh, a lot of sense it's too complicated yeah it's, it's weird complicated expensive. you get hacked expensive. it's expensive absolutely see see i did not even have to tell you like there's so many problems you know sir <laughs> right so which means that is a problem and uh, at least but same my thing is i always want to know so mm. we started uh, asking a lot of our customers and stuff like you know what is stopping you and these are the answers that we got which i realized yes there's a problem uh, which means there has to be a solution but it has to be a solution that really works uh, which is find a decentralized uh, you know or build a decentralized blockchain which can scale up based on the demand so that your fees will always be low and doesn't matter if 5 million people come five people come 5 million people come 50 million people come it will always be able to accommodate them and that was the need and uh, i while when i was running the exchange i had rem i had met a guy in 2019 uh, that was i think a year year and a half after the exchange i started who told me that he was building a software to uh, which was a, a blockchain software uh, which would scale with demand um and i had loved the idea but he was still at the idea stage and he is still implementing so i stayed in touch with him so when i about when i started thinking about this problem in uh, 2021 i went back to him to see what you know where he was with this uh, ideas and, and uh, just the problem was essentially 20, 2021 a lot of on chain activity on ethereum yeah. nfts and then you realize every transaction costs like 100 yeah. bucks which makes no sense right yeah, so that's yeah, the yeah. moment you say yeah. i'm going to go back to this right. person i mean i stopped my i myself stopped it like you know i i used to uh, enjoy uh, you know transferring uh, on ethereum and you know uh, you mostly use ethereum honestly and mm. or bitcoin uh, but yeah I, i realized when the market was at the bull i was not using it you know you can't uh, i mean it makes no sense yeah it's pricing me out yeah. <laughs> you know it's going to price everyone out uh, and the only reason you would use is because if you are going to make a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars and the only way to make that money is because you have to pay a hundred dollars in transaction costs then you would do it but not because you want to show your friend how you know decentralization works you can't send him one dollar <laughs> so so that was a problem that i saw and i realized that you know this has to be solved mm -hmm. so i when i uh reached out back to this person i'd met uh, i was surprised to see that he had achieved a lot of the things that we discussed back then in 2019 um, and so i uh, got him uh, and this is my i'm talking about my co-founder at shardium omar um, he he is based out of dallas in texas i got him to fly down to dubai i told him let's catch up you know i wanted to understand whether he's still on the same mission and whether he we we align on our objectives uh, because i saw this as an amazing solution mm. this was a brand new blockchain built from scratch with only one objective can it scale that was the only thing that he wanted to build so and uh, so we met and i told him you know this is what i am been thinking and uh, you know our thoughts aligned and in two days uh, you know we decided that this is what we will do now and that's how shardium was launched um So before that he was only going to build the software by the way and just open source it he was not building it to launch a blockchain mm. he wanted anyone and everyone to you know just build their own chain using that software but yeah we decided that we'll build the blockchain first and we'll launch it as uh, shardium and that's how uh, shardium came into the picture and we are now 2 years into that uh, yeah 
So what is Shardium if you have to explain this to your mother? It's an auto-scaling blockchain. It scales automatically. So it's a blockchain that scales and that says cheap yeah. if there is a lot of transaction on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's very simple. Um, and it's done, a, if we want to go deeper, it's done a lot of these uh, UX improvements, which actually are uh, normal, but they're abnormal in the, uh, in the Web3 world. Simple example is if you if you think about uh, you as a customer, uh, when was the last time you decided how much you will pay for a service or you know for a for a product? In my life, in general. Yeah, in general. When was the last time you, Today? as a customer, decided that uh, you know no this is how much I will pay? Yeah, every day. Today. No, I mean um, in terms of let's say. Um, okay, I'll, gi- I'll give a more specific question. When you buy a book, do you decide how much you'll pay for it? Nah, no, you don't. Absolutely not. The price is set. <laughs> yeah, or when you buy an iPhone, do you decide? No, no you right? Don't. Yeah, but when you make a transaction, why do you have to decide how much to set as fees mm. on the blockchain? Now, go to the Web2 world. Whenever you buy any service, you know, the service will tell you upfront this is how much it costs. Yeah, yeah, it's much easier. Most people don't want to have to choose. Yes, obviously. because choices are the biggest uh, demotivators for consumers. Absolutely. So in our uh, blockchain in Shardim, you don't have a fee market. It's a flat fee. Mm. You know, you don't have to choose. It's a flat, small, tiny fee that everyone pays. The second is, um, you know, uh, MEV, which we talk about. Why does it exist? It's because anyone can, you know, pay a higher fee and get that transaction before you. Again, unnatural. You know, you came first, you should be served first. Mm. You stay in a queue... If, you know, tomorrow uh, you go to a cafe and they say, you know, the guy behind you is going to pay <laughs> double for the coffee. Would you be okay with that as a consumer? Not really. No, exactly. <laughs> not really. So then, then we should not be okay with that. So we have first come first serve. You know, when you fire a transaction on uh, Shardium, no one can overtake that. It's time stamped. So that's how you, you know, do. And these are things that already exist. This is not magic. Mm. They just exist. But unfortunately, uh, in Web3, um, because we we've, we've been in that hyper experimentation mode, whether you know things will work or not, we've not had those finished uh, consumer friendly products built yet. Uh, so yeah, I think these are some of the key you know UX things that we've gone to improve on Shardium. Um, and yeah, that's how it's different. But end of the day, we've chosen to use the EVM, and that's one of the mistake I've seen a lot of newer blockchains that are trying to build scalability do, which is they build their own virtual machine which means as a developer, you have to now rebuild all of the products and the tools and everything for that. And the ecosystem is broken then. Mm. Um, so you, you're never going to win. So we decided to use the EVM so that uh, nobody has to rebuild for Shardium. You can just deploy what you've built on Ethereum on Shardium as well. There's a lot of layer ones. There are a lot of layer twos. So some people might ask you, I mean, you kind of answered already, but... What do you tell someone who says, oh man, the world doesn't need another layer one? Yeah, see, I think uh, if, if, you think, if you think about the, I mean, there are so many ways to answer this, but uh, you know, the, the easiest answer is when I told you about you know, layer one, you just started uh, firing off all the issues that you see, right? Um, so it's very easy. It's very obvious, the problems that exist. And if we say that uh, you should not work on a problem because there are 100 solutions, we will never see innovation in this world. You should not work on a problem if you don't see that as a problem. You know, if it mm. does not exist. And that's why m- many people make a mistake. Sometimes they, they want to create a problem. So don't create a problem. So when you think about L1s, I don't have to tell you the problems. You will tell me, you know, any customer, anyone who's used an L1 will tell me the problems, which means this is what I'm listening to. I'm not worried about, you know, there being 10 solutions. That could be a thousand solutions. But if I hear these problems and if I face those problems, that means there's no perfect solution yet. And someone has to solve that. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, We don't believe, you know, we want to decide Mm -hmm. whether to build something or not based on how many solutions exist in the market. We should decide whether the problem is solved or not. And I think the problem is not solved. 
and we are trying to do that we are trying to solve that problem and we may not especially in financial market we may not be the one product that solves all but we'll be part of the solution mm. so the approach is again extremely practical hey we'll try to solve as many problems as possible and then probably at some point there's going to be a cross chain world that yeah. take the best of breed right right and we want to be part of that because because we have this approach that's extremely practical right in, th- in taking feedback from people and also thinking what do people actually want or need and the, 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 the the experience or the user experience is probably much closer to a web two world than uh, any of these kind of fancy new thing that we're seeing that only nerds think are cool. But that, again, you understood obviously because you are pro at building uh, applications for the masses, everything is about, you want as as low, as less, as, as low friction as possible, right? right? What's How do I reduce my friction the maximum so that people just take this journey and, um, and uh, that's something that the Web3 world definitely struggles with. <laughs> It's also because of, uh, I would say, um, a lot of the entrepreneurs in Web3 are first-timers. And, uh, you know, they're going to make mistakes, which is okay. Um, but we can also build on our experiences. Mm. And I think uh, I'm lucky that I've built in Web2 um, and built a large product there to know what consumers want. Uh, for a lot of new entrepreneurs, it takes a few years and our ecosystem will mature. I think, you know, we'll go from Web3, today's the state of Web3. Uh, also, it's needed is, um, I would say, hyper experiment without worrying about whether a problem exists or not. But that's great for innovation, by the way. It's just that I don't want to be in that part right now uh, in my at this stage of my life. Mm. But I think we need those entrepreneurs as well. People who mindlessly just create things. Mm. Because that's when, you know, you'll actually get products that people did not know they wanted. The real inv- innovation yes. that, that ended up being the mega successes. Exactly, exactly. So those things are needed. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, usually when you're younger, you can take those risks. So you should, you know, uh, let these uh, boring things for people with uh, 20 years of experience do it. Uh, maybe, you know, you do the interesting part. I love that, but I know the chances of success are slim. Do you think you became more risk averse with success and Not time? Really. I think uh, I, I see it the other way around. Uh, it's less to do with this. It's about how my mind thinks in terms of solving things. I want to now be more, pra- uh, like I would say, more practical mm. about the problems. I can see a problem, then I don't want to unsee and try to think of, you know, I think maybe towards maybe a new journey, I'll start thinking again. I used to do that when I was younger, yes. I think in my journey right now, I, I know that there are some problems that have to be solved first. Um, and then maybe later I can think about, you know, maybe this is a problem and let's solve it. Mm. But today it's just so obvious. Mm. <laughs> you know, there are so many problems. I want to solve that first. Yeah. Shardium is a non-for-profit organization, whereas Was Your X is a for-profit organization. What's the biggest difference between building a for-profit company such as a crypto exchange and a non-for-profit crypto network? Um, I think uh, a world of difference. Um, you know, when you're building a for-profit, I mean, I would, don't want to get into the fact that you'll have to maximize for, um, you know, profitability in a for-profit, which is so obvious. And in a non-profit, you don't have to worry. I would rather think um, more in the, in the sense of, you know, when you're building a non-profit, Uh, decentralized ecosystem, you need to ensure that this ecosystem will survive and thrive and continue to grow without you in that. Uh, and not just without you, without your team also in that. I mean, that's the ultimate, uh, I would say, vision for anything decentralized is, and Satoshi Nakamoto has sort of shown that way, if you think mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. Like, it's never existed. Yeah. I mean, it's never been there. Yes. Yeah. And Bitcoin is only growing. Yeah. So that's the, I would say, the st- standard for everyone who's building a non-profit decentralized organization. Can you reach that level where uh, without, you know, your involvement or your team's involvement, the project can still grow and th- survive and thrive. That's true decentralization. And uh, what we did with, uh, you know, with that vision was to start with the non-profit. 
So the nonprofit is just the start of that ultimate vision, which is can this project be truly decentralized in terms of not just the running the nodes where everyone in the world can run a node on Shardium, but can it also be built by the community? Mm. That's the ultimate goal. But we had to start with a nonprofit because if we started with a profit, you will never reach that end. You know, so the the nonprofit is just the start of a true decentralized uh, project. If I play the devil advocate there, the token holders, right? They're sort of like shareholders. Mm. There's a different incentive system, but it's still kind of in one way or another similar. If you have the decentralized ethos, you might see things differently, but I still think, and I'm probably not the only one, that most people are in crypto to make money. And even the OGs, they say, if you want to bootstrap a decentralized network, the best way is to make your early adopters and your er er early token holders rich, which is what Bitcoin and e Ethereum did really well, right? So can we really say that a crypto network is a non-for-profit organization when for it to succeed, the majority of the token holders are probably there to make money and the protocol at some point needs to become profitable which is, for example, the case with Ethereum, right? You're right. What's your take on that? No, so I think uh, you need to separate out, the, the, at least in the case of Shardium, the foundation from the network. You know, those are two different things. The foundation's uh, role is to create the network. And the network's role is to ultimately be able to govern itself, to run. And the network would have to be profitable in order to, you know, keep operating and and um, but if I was to start with a for-profit organization which is running a decentralized network then I, you know this for-profit will always find ways to keep extracting money from this network so so the non-profit objective is so that the non-profit as an entity is not really motivated to extract any profits out of this network but the network itself can decide what it wants based on the network token holders which is you know everyone so if you today say that everyone's objective is to maximize um, profits, the network will probably go in that direction. Maybe in the future, it will be to maximize efficiency or maximize, you know, something else. And, but the network holders can decide that. Um, that need not be a nonprofit. But the, 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 the entity creating this network has to be a nonprofit when mm -hmm. you're starting something decently. So it's two different things. Um, and I don't believe decentralization is about uh, not making money or, mm. you know, not being rich or something. <laughs> I think uh, that's a false way of looking at things because if there's no economic incentive, um, I don't think uh, you'll see massive innovation. Even in climate, you know, yeah. stuff, there is economic incentive. No one is doing it just for the environment. Uh, they're gaining something out of it. They're saving money somewhere, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I think... Uh, it's important to have economic incentives. The world operates that way. Innovation comes about. Uh, but it should be for anyone and everyone who wants to be part of it, rather than just one entity that always makes money in a centralized ecosystem. Mm. Like when you share, you know, when you talk about, let's say, uh, Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, I mean, if you're a creator, maybe yes, but in general, you're just adding to the shareholders of YouTube's value. You're not adding to, you know, your own value. Um, but in a network, in a decentralized network, whenever you're promoting it, you're getting your friends on board, you're adding to your own value. So so I think value creation is important. And uh, without value creation, I don't think we can build systems that will eventually be used by, you know, billions of people. Absolutely. But yet, your goal, obviously, to create value, but it's to be cheap. And the two big dogs in the layer one, Ethereum, Solana, completely different approach. One wants to be, I mean, one wants to be as decentralized as possible, Ethereum, but very expensive. The problem that you faced, I faced, these transactions that are too, too expensive. And then there is Solana. Centralization issues, etc. fine, but like the main kind of argument is, hey guys, Solana, one day you will need to be profitable. How can you become profitable if your goal is to be as cheap as possible? And I would ask the same question to you, Shardeum. 
how can you make, build a, a profitable protocol when the ultimate goal is to make this transaction as cheap as possible? See, I think, uh, you know, it also depends on how you are architected. Uh, you know, for the Shadium network, for example, um, we don't have a technical upper limit on how many transactions can be executed on the network. Um, it's, it's just constrained by the number of nodes in the network. And anyone in, in the world can run a node. And our uh, requirement for running a node is just uh, about 4 GB of RAM and 200 GB of hard disk. So one node on our network would cost maybe $200 or something. As against, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, just the hardware requirement of nodes in a lot of networks it runs into hundreds of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, in our case, it's a very, um, you know, minimal configuration node. Um, now, if you, there is a point, so we, we've done some maths to know that um, uh, above a certain number of transactions per second, the network gets into profitability because, you know, a node with 4 GB RAM can run hundreds of thousands of transactions. or In fact, it can run a million, millions of transactions per day. And even if your fee is one cent, you're making a lo- large amount of money. And if and this has to be true, by the way, because if you think about it, none of the Web2 would otherwise work. Mm. If you look at Web2 products, they do millions of transactions. They charge you just $5 and $10. And only five, less than less than 2% of the people ever pay. So, you know, it's, it's, it's actually uh, incorrect thinking that uh, technology is very cheap if you want it to be cheap. Um, and you can actually afford uh, low fees if you're architected in the right way. And I think that is how uh, Shadium has architected itself, which is no special hardware needed. Um, you know, you don't have to run uh, 36 GB RAM and have GPUs and stuff. This is just a normal computer. Um, it will eventually many people will run you know uh, either from their homes or but on the cloud also you can run it and it costs you 30 50 dollars a month mm. so you just have to make sure you you process transactions that are worth more than 40 dollars maybe and you just have to make sure that your technology is actually used yeah. and you're building demand yeah and that's, creating value that's the, go- that's the exactly. ultimate goal so it's right. kind of like forcing you to innovate more on the value creation side than just saying also we're expensive yeah, like yeah. Ethereum so and therefore ah now the network is profitable so we do not really incentivize to improve it right, right 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 exactly so and and for us to be profitable uh, you know as a network we'll need to have um, tens of millions of people on it mm. so that's a you know I love that <laughs> as a challenge that you know I need to bring more people yeah so I don't have to stop people I have to bring more and more people if we get to 100 million people, we are even more profitable. So, so that's a direct correlation between adoption and profitability, which has always been the case in Web2 and in, in, in general, Absolutely. In anything. You've never seen anyone being, uh, you know, stopping people from coming, right? You need more and more and you scale up. And that's the kind of network we are trying to build. So we are directly motivated to bring more people. At no point will we say, you know, this is good enough. Yeah, which is the right incentives to have, obviously. You told me you are obviously extremely focused on your project. I mean, the different companies that you run, but there is also a few other kind of sub areas of the industry that you like. One of them is a decentralized social network. Why do we need decentralized social network? <laughs> I think uh, one is I have a personal enmity with all the centralized social networks. You uh, you should know from my story. Obviously. (laughs) (laughs) So that's my first reason that I I personally believe that all these uh, centralized networks should die. No one, I I don't think any one entity should have so much control. Mm -hmm. You know, it it is just, it never works well. And we've already seen that happen. You know, that's the reason why, um, you know, all of the founders of these social networks, they called in Congress and... You know, then all these um, new uh, uh, secrets come out in the open about how your data was misused or, you know, how your reach was, you were shadow banned or, you know, how your tweets were not allowed to be shown. It can All of these things, why? Because centralization. Absolutely. So I think uh, it's a no brainer that uh, a true social network should be under no one's control because social network is free speech and doesn't matter, you know, 
how uh, genuine any founder's intention is. Uh, like, for example, I, uh, you know, like the fact that Elon Musk talks about free speech on Twitter. But see, end of the day, uh, he'll ha- also, they'll uh, have to adhere by the r- local regulations and rules by the various governments. And while uh, the person doing it might have great intention, the world, the way it is structured will not allow him. But if you now uh, change this to a true decentralized social network, you're not relying on the promises of an individual or a group of people or a large board of mem- uh, companies, uh, like a company with a board of uh, directors who are independent and whatever. You don't have to rely on any of those things. You have to just rely on technology, which you can always rely on. And uh, know that, you know, you're protected in terms of uh, if you want uh, uh, anonymity, you're protected, privacy, you're protected. If you want free speech, you're truly protected. So I think uh, that's why I believe that uh, decentralized social network is a must. The, the thing, the challenges, and I feel the mistakes that are being done is to try to replicate what exists. Like, you know, trying to replicate Twitter. Uh, it's a lot like, um, if you think about it, when there were uh, these physical newspapers, if you wanted to build an online newspaper, it's like trying to build an exact replica of how the physical newspaper is. Uh, but that's not the form we consume it in today. Mm. In fact, when you get that PDF of a newspaper, uh, you know, scan, you don't feel like reading it. Uh, news is consumed in a different way online. Mm. So I think it's the same concept that we need to start thinking about when we think about decentralized social networks. It's not going to be a, a decentralized Twitter or it's not going to be a decentralized uh, Facebook. I believe there's going to be a new uh, form factor and a new way of uh, bringing decentralized social networks to the world. I don't have that idea. Like I said, uh, you know, some 22-year-old or t- uh, 23-year-old is probably yeah. building it, okay? And it will take off, uh, you know. And this is the kind of those mega, massive uh, scale companies that we talk about that should be built. Uh, but yeah, it, it'll come. And I, 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 I strongly believe it will. And I think it should. Uh, if, if we don't want our future generations to be, you know, confined to a few centralized three or five social networks deciding what the world is going to talk, what the world is going to consume. I think that needs to change. So I'm a big believer of uh, decentralized social. You also love uh, decentralized gaming topic. Yeah. Why? Um, more from, I just, um, you know. Are you a gamer? Uh, or were you a gamer? I, I, I was. Um, and um, I mean, um, I, I start started a game yeah i was into games very early i think uh right from the days of the handheld video games that mm. used to come to then uh, the era of sega and everything to then the uh, simba era where i had an engage i don't know if you know there was a nokia engage phone which was okay. made for gaming um uh, this was way, way back you know <laughs> uh 2003 4 uh, uh and then um then PS5, uh, and now I have the PS5, uh, but it's reduced now over the last, because of entrepreneurship, you know, uh, I play it more like a, just to relax. Uh, I like games when, because I don't think about anything else. Anything else you do, I think we were talking at the beginning how attention has, um, you know, reduced, but I feel games still hold your attention. You can't think about anything else. When you're playing a game, you're in that world. So gaming yeah. is your meditation. Yeah, gaming is my meditation, and uh, I think it's everyone's meditation. So, uh, so that's that's I think the reason uh, why I like games. But why do I believe um, you know decentralized gaming will emerge is because um, when you're building your world, that meditative world. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether it'll still remain meditation, but how about making it a little more permanent, ma- making it a little more valuable. And I think uh, the decentralized aspect will make it. Mm-hmm. Maybe after that, it may not be meditative. It might be <laughs> stressful, you know, that there's wealth in your game now. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that is this whole casual gaming, which I think may not really need to be, um, you know, on chain or connected to decentralized uh, ecosystem. But there is this whole uh, career gaming, I would call it, where career you're, gaming, yeah, so you're, people yeah, making, you're making a profession, of, yeah. you know, out of it. Um, and we've seen glimpses of that, like Twitch, for example, just, you know, professional gamers uh, yep. just uh, streaming and people watch it and they make money. And then there are gaming competitions and all. But I think we could really have, a, you know, a world where uh, games and their assets are, uh, you know, valuable. 
and also transferable mm-hmm. so you move so all of these things are only possible with um, you know uh, a decentralized e- ecosystem being attached to the game and i think that's where uh, gaming will probably take off in a good way but again like i said i don't know what form shape some you have to talk to some you know <laughs> young guy who's building something there <laughs> Uh, a last one you told me is a key infrastructure, even in the Web2 world, right? But also in the Web3 world that is still underlooked and that you're very bullish on. Decentralized notification and more specifically a protocol called push protocol. Why is what push protocol uh, is building so important for our space? Yeah, I think, uh, and this is one of those, you know, um, often where uh, it's obvious, but it's still not obvious kind of thing. Uh, and I think uh, if you if you look at your uh, um, mobile phone usage, uh, it's filled with notifications. You know, for good or bad, better or worse, notifications are important and they are here to stay. Because um, with so many things happening around the world, you can at least focus and make sure that you only get notifications for, let's say, the important things that matter to you. But that's your entry point. That's something that you don't ignore. And uh, if you know, if you look at the progress of Web3, uh, maybe we've started with less products, but in the next three to five years, we'll be bombarded. We already feel that, you know, overload of so many Web3 products. Yeah. And this will just continue to grow with a uh, decent life, social coming in, gaming coming in. It'll just keep growing. Uh, at which stage, I think the industry will also realize that, uh, you know, notifications are going to be much more important. Uh, but you can't plug into an existing centralized e- ecosystem for those notifications. You'll need to have a decentralized notification protocol where you can just, you know, use that to deliver notifications to your customers or you as a user of a decentralized social network could just, you know, plug this into any of the app that you're using and receive notifications for, let's say, every like that you get. I'm just thinking out loud. But that is something that, you know, does not exist today. So it's more the infrastructure to provide notification in a decentralized world that doesn't exist rather than a purely decentralized way of doing notifications, right? Yeah, I mean, um, it's a protocol where, um, you know, anyone could plug into that and say that, for example, give me, um, you know, you can create channels on push, for example, you can create channels, you can create channel for, let's say, um, a DEX, where you want to know every time a particular token is traded. Mm. I want to know this. Okay. Um, and you can build that channel and then that channel could be used even by a centralized product if needed to deliver the notification to you. Or maybe someone would build a, a, a product which takes that notification and then does an action on it. So, so a lot of these things can be done. This is just a pipe which okay. you know brings you actions that happen. So it's a sort of oracle for notification. Sort of, yeah. To in be a way, like, yeah, to yeah, make yeah, it like yeah. simpler. Okay. Yeah, it's... So, and that I think is going to be very important because everyone, th- that's also where interconnectivity goes to the next level where, you know, there will be different uh, products want to interact with different, uh, you know, uh, in different ways. Um, and uh, you could use these notification channels to, uh, you know, do those things. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think that infrastructure is yet to take up. We talk about oracles, we talk about, you know, um, L2s today and mm-hmm. uh, we talk about um, all these different protocols but we don't talk about a key infra which is the notification ecosystem so I'm a big believer in that you said with the cryptocurrency revolution change in the fintech industry is inevitable why is Web3 such an important technological revolution um, this you, said, you said 30 years ago or what are we now? It's 2024. It's 30 years ago, I would have made my mission to get as many people on the internet as possible because that's where magic happens, right? And obviously we call this crypto technology Web3, which is a kind of continuation of Web1, where we had then Web2, the mobile wave, and now Web3. But for a lot of people, it might not seem that obvious that this is kind of like the next evolution of the internet. Why is it for you? I think uh, if you think about, uh, you know, progress in general, what is progress? Progress, end of the day, is more freedom. That's what progress is. 
simple as that it always gives you more freedom you know and uh, if you look at the internet the progress has been that you're going towards more freedom so the question is where do you see yourself being able to get more freedom is it on a on a web 2 or a web 1 which is um, you know which exists as it as it does versus a web 3 which is decentralized and the the answer is always going to be simple which is a decentralized web 3 ecosystem is going to give me more freedom than a centralized one you know i cannot do if i use a product in a centralized product i can do three things i can't do five things that will always be there there'll always be you know restrictions of some sort or the other or there are also compromises that you're making with your privacy or with control you know what if tomorrow gmail locks you out and sure these are you know doomsday prediction kind of thing this may not always happen but that should start you know putting that idea in your head that that's a possibility and as um, you know as entrepreneurs our job should always be to get people towards better you know uh, products and services that give them more freedom so i see this just an evolution of our uh, freedom online we are going to be more free than we were uh, you know that's why the internet came right hmm. it gave you the freedom to access any information uh tell your you know talk your mind out uh, connect with anyone in the world mm-hmm. versus the offline world which was only 10 20 miles around you you could access here suddenly you had the entire world now web3 is giving you even more freedom which is freedom of information but also the freedom of value owning yeah it's basically what uh, chris dixon calls read web1 right. web2 read write web3 read, read write own. own yeah yeah so ownership also comes in and uh, yeah i think uh, that's how i see this uh, evolution and uh, i want to get more people to that freer world than what exists in web2 and many times you know when you are in an ecosystem you don't see that you know till it does not happen to you maybe mm. to a lot of us in web3 it's happened faster but it's going to happen to everyone everyone's going to get affected by um, you know the the negatives of a centralized ecosystem today it's probably 10 million people tomorrow it'll be 100 million people everyone will get affected at some point in their life um, and maybe that's a moment for them to switch but i would say it's our responsibility so that they never even have to reach that stage we should get them earlier you know otherwise um, they'll all have to suffer the way all of us have suffered uh, so that's what probably motivates us to do this faster others yes you just sit back and relax in the next uh, 30 40 years everyone's going to be on web3 by the way but i think uh, that would mean an entire generation of people who never experienced true freedom and i don't want that to happen so mm. maybe you know we need to push faster we should not have everyone go through these struggles get them faster to a decent life ecosystem thank you nishan thank you for this great conversation and thank you for following this mission of bringing more freedom to people because this can only make the world a better place Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me here. It was amazing uh, to have these, I would say, deep conversations, uh, which, uh, which I, I, usually it's really you know surface level discussions. Mm-hmm. I think here we uh, you know truly went deep into uh, quite a variety of um, topics, and I really enjoyed uh, having this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Mm-hmm.